To make things more concrete, let's take a look at an example. Uh, suppose we wish to design a simple cruise control. In that case, we might have a differential equation describing the dynamics of the vehicle. So let's say it's of this form, the mass times the acceleration, which we'll write as v dot because it's v, the velocity or speed of the vehicle that we wish to control, uh, plus a friction term or a drag term. We'll make this linear so that we have a linear equation with constant coefficients. So b is a constant drag or friction coefficient. That is equal to an externally applied force F. Um, so um, if you like, you can rewrite this as mv dot equals F minus bv. So here the idea is that the frictional force opposes the motion of the vehicle. That's why you have the minus sign. You could get this from a free body diagram if you like. Um, F and BV here where this is the positive V direction. So the force F accelerates you in the positive V direction. Then there's a frictional force BV that retards the motion of the vehicle. Now, what is this force F? Um, this force F may be partly um, a force that uh, uh, cruise control can manipulate, but it may include other forces that act on the car. For instance, if the car is climbing a hill, there will be a force of gravity against which it has to work. So let's let F equal U plus D, where U is a so-called control input that we can manipulate or that an automatic controller can manipulate. In this case, it would probably just be the throttle of the car. And D is a force that we can't control or manipulate. These we call disturbances. So again, this might be things like forces of gravity or maybe a, a headwind or something like that. Um, so we'd like ideally to be able to control our vehicle so that uh, the speed tracks a desired speed and does so even in the presence of these so-called disturbance inputs. So a control problem might be defined, roughly speaking, as that of ensuring that the vehicle speed follows a given so-called reference input, or we often say tracks a reference input. And ideally, it should do this even in the presence of disturbances. Now, for reasons that will be um, studied in greater detail in SE380, it's often convenient to do this with the use of feedback. And I'll draw a block diagram to represent a feedback uh, architecture. Um, since we're working in the Laplace domain, we're just working with algebraic equations. And this block diagram is a convenient way of uh, representing a system of equations. It's easy to see what the transfer function of the system is going to be just by taking Laplace transforms of all the terms in the differential equation. We'll have a transfer function 1 over ms plus b, 
the input of, to which is our force F, or maybe I'll write it as a transform. And as we said, the force F may be a sum of our control input, which we can manipulate, in this case the throttle position, and a disturbance input, which will represent other forces beyond our control. The output is the speed V of the vehicle. And we can assume that we're given a reference input which represents the desired speed of the vehicle. So R of T in the time domain <coughs> would give the desired speed as a function of time. And we would try to make sure that V of T tracks that reference. So how do we do that? Well, a typical way, which you'll study in SE 380, is to use so-called error feedback. What that means is that we take this reference input and we compare it to the speed of the vehicle. So I'm leaving out a block that represents the measuring device that we would use for that, but we take a measurement of the output that we're trying to control, in this case the speed of the vehicle, and we compare it to the reference signal that the speed of the vehicle is supposed to track. The difference is what we call our error signal, E of S. And that can be the input to an automatic controller, which we'll represent just as a block here. And while the transfer function of the vehicle itself is a given, we can decide what to put in this box. So we can decide what this transfer function C of S is going to be that generates the control signal U as a function of the input E, which is the error signal. So if you think about it, <coughs> this probably captures reasonably well the kind of architecture and uh, algorithm, if you like, that you use when you're driving a car. Um, you watch and see where the car is uh, within the road and you adjust the steering accordingly. Uh, you compare the speed with, uh, with, with your desired speed. You have a certain idea of how fast you want to be driving. You glance at the speedometer every now and then to see how fast you're going. And according to the difference between your desired speed and the measured speed, you make some adjustments to the throttle position. So the question is, <clears throat> when you're designing an automatic controller, if you've decided that you want to use feedback, which is uh, usually the best way to go, the question then is, what do you put in this block? What do you choose as your controller? And for this example, at least initially, let's start with the simplest possible controller. And that is just a constant gain. This is called a proportional controller because the control signal is simply proportional to the error signal. And we sometimes call the equation that governs the operation of a controller a control law. So at every point in time, u of t will simply be some constant k sub p, p for proportional, times the error signal, e of t. <coughs> so this is an example of a static or memoryless system. That's why it's just about the simplest controller you could try. Okay, so the question now is, okay, how do we integrate this new equation into our model? So, of course, if we take Laplace transforms, we just get u of s equals kp times e of s, just by linearity. So we know that this transfer function is just going to be this constant kp, 
But um, how do we analyze this system now? What, what are the important transfer functions to look at? Well, initially, we can, we can uh, forget about disturbance inputs and just see if we can arrange for the system to do the job in the absence of disturbances, in which case we can set d of s equal to zero and find the transfer function that relates r of s, our reference input, to v of s, because after all, what we want v of s to do is to follow that reference input. So let's see how we would do that. So for now, we'll assume that d of s is identically 0. And it's really just a matter of solving the system of algebraic equations represented by uh, this block diagram. Uh, so we know that uh, v of s is 1 over ms plus b times f of s. And what will f of s be, the force applied to the vehicle that drives the vehicle forward? Well, if d of s is 0, it's just going to be equal to u of s, which in turn is c of s times e of s. And c of s is just the constant kp. So we'll have 1 over ms plus b times kp times e of s, our error signal. Now again, our error signal, as the name implies, is the difference between the desired value of the speed of the vehicle, namely r in the time domain r of t, uh, and the actual speed of the vehicle, or in, 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 in reality, the, um, a measurement of the speed of the vehicle. So this should be an s. So let's just use these last two equations to eliminate E of s. We don't need to know exactly what the error signal is. We're really interested in the relationship between the reference input and the speed, which is supposed to track that reference signal. So we can replace E of s in the second last equation with R of s minus V of s, and then solve for V of s. So what we'll get is that V of s is kp over ms plus b divided by 1 plus kp over ms plus b. So whereas if we were just looking at the um, um, relationship between u of s and v of s, we would just have this transfer function 1 over ms plus b. Um, by putting the controller in series with the vehicle, we get a kp multiplying that transfer function. And then the effect of the feedback is to take the resulting transfer function, kp over ms plus b, and divide it by 1 plus kp over ms plus b. So this is how um, feedback can effectively change the poles of your system. If we look at this transfer function, its pole is going to be different from the pole of the vehicle transfer function itself. We can simplify it, of course, by multiplying through by ms plus b. So in that case, we get kp over uh, ms plus b plus kp. In other words, uh, that should still be multiplied by R of S. In other words, uh, Kp over M divided by S plus B plus Kp over M. Um, on the other hand, I guess if we want to compare this with the standard first order system, we could instead divide b by B plus Kp and get kp over b plus kp divided by s times m over b plus kp plus 1. 
So this is exactly of the form of our standard first order system, except um, the key parameters, both the DC gain and the time constant depend on this parameter KP of our controller, and we can choose that value as we like. So the DC gain, let's call it K, is KP over B plus KP. And the time constant, tau, is M over B plus KP. Let's compare this with the transfer function of the vehicle. In that case, our transfer function was 1 over ms plus b, which if we want to put it in the form of the standard first order system, is just 1 over b times s times m over b plus 1. So whereas this has as its DC gain 1 over B, now we have KP over B plus KP as our DC gain. And where this had as its time constant M over B, we now have M over B plus KP. Typically, the problem when you're designing control systems is to make them respond quickly enough. And as we saw when looking at the, the response of standard first order systems like these ones, the speed of response, uh, the speed at which everything takes place depends on the time constant, tau. In the case of the uncontrolled vehicle, uh, that time constant is m over b. The, the effect of adding the feedback with the proportional controller is to make the time constant m over b plus kp. So the larger we make kp as a positive number, the smaller the time constant is going to be, and therefore the faster the response of the system will be. And we probably won't want to make it too fast, but uh, typically the problem is to speed up the response of systems. Um, we also, again, want V of S to track the input to our control system, R the reference input. <clears throat> so ideally, if R is a step input, we would want the time constant to be reasonably short, so the output converges toward that step reasonably quickly. We would also want the DC gain to be close to 1, <clears throat> so that in steady state, if you like, the speed is close to the desired value of the speed as represented by the reference input. This shows that the bigger we make Kp, the closer we will get to 1. <clears throat> you may ask why we don't just multiply the reference input by, say, the inverse of this DC gain, so that we get a DC gain of 1. The problem with that is that typically you don't know the parameters of your model, like this quant quantity b, very precisely, and you have to be prepared, prepared for them to vary. Uh, you know, if we put a roof rack on the car and uh, put a big load on top of it, the drag coefficient is going to change a lot. So we want to treat these uh, parameters usually as uh, approximate and uh, not very well known, and we'd like our system to function reasonably well, whatever the values of these parameters. So we'll just stick with our feedback uh, setup. Um, so. I think you can see that this looks reasonably promising. Um, let's call this transfer function uh, HRV, because it's the transfer function from the reference input R. To the speed V, so HRV of S is this kp over b plus kp 
divided by s times uh, m over b plus kp plus 1. So we can similarly find a transfer function from uh, the disturbance input d to v. Essentially what we do is just set r equal to 0, identically. So in that case, uh, we will have v of s equals h dv of s times d of s. then you can apply the principle of superposition and you can easily verify that this is an instance of superposition you can actually take account of both inputs the reference input and the disturbance input by using both of these transfer functions the dependence on the reference input is given by hrv And the, depend the dependence on the disturbance input is given by HDV. So you can actually take account of both inputs, model what is, uh, strictly speaking, a multivariable system uh, using two transfer functions, even though transfer functions don't really model multivariable systems. They model single input, single output systems. But superposition sometimes lets us model systems that are technically multivariable ones using transfer functions. Okay. So again, um, this looks pretty helpful. Um, we can ensure that uh, the time constant has uh, a desired val value by playing around with Kp. So if we wish in particular a time constant tau that is, say, less than what we have without any control, namely m over b, we can choose kp appropriately. So in particular, if we look at a plot of the pole on the complex plane. As we increase Kp, this pole will actually move to the left. So in principle, we can make the system as fast as we like. We can make the speed converge as rapidly as we would like toward the reference input. Now in practice we don't necessarily want it to uh, converge too rapidly and that could get quite uncomfortable for the passengers. That is discussed a little bit in the assignment. We can also ensure that in a steady state uh, we have good tracking of the reference input. So by making Kp big enough, we can at the same time not only speed up the transient response, but we can make the DC gain arbitrarily close to 1. Because that DC gain is, once again, Kp over B plus Kp. So as Kp goes to infinity, this goes to 1. Again, we 
won't want to make KP too big. One reason is that it will make the uh, transient uh, decay too fast and it will make the ride a little rough for the passengers. But there are other reasons as well. Um, for instance, if you're measuring the speed, there's normally some noise associated with any measurement and uh, that noise is going to get amplified by KP. Uh, but you'll get into all of that in SE380. For now, just notice that by increasing KP, you can make the DC gain uh, arbitrarily close to one. So that's a quick look at proportional control used in a cruise control. Um, there are reasons why we don't use exactly this setup uh, when making cruise control systems. Uh, that's just, that too is discussed a little bit in the assignment. Um, but here's, here's one point. Suppose, you know, I guess it, it, it's reasonably evident that with this proportional control scheme, uh, you can never uh, reduce the DC gain to zero. Uh, this formula shows that as long as B is non-zero, uh, this DC gain is not going to be equal to one, but uh, you can also think about it physically. Um, suppose that in steady state, um, the error were zero. So if the speed were exactly equal to the desired speed, then um, the error would be zero. But with this proportional controller, that would mean that the control input would be zero too. So in this case, that's a, a throttle input you like. So um, if the throttle input is zero, but there is drag on the car, the speed will drop. So this means that you could never track step reference inputs with zero steady state error. So this shows in a more physical way why proportional control can't allow for what we might call perfect asymptotic tracking of steps. Now, in fact, there is a way, a simple controller, that will allow you to have this perfect asymptotic tracking of step reference inputs. What do you need for that? The key thing is that you need to have a controller that maintains a non-zero throttle input. So we need a controller that can maintain um, a non-zero throttle input. even if, even when the error goes to zero. So we'll talk about such an example next week. You may wish to think about it uh, yourself in the meantime. That will conclude this week's lectures. Talk to you later.